Winifred Frick is the chief scientist at Bat Conservation International and an associate research professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work combines empirical field research and quantitative modeling to best determine how bat populations are impacted by anthropogenic stressors and find ways to enact effective conservation measures. She also works with local partners around the world to study endangered bat species and develop effective conservation plans to prevent extinctions. And that's really the topic of her talk, a mission to end bat extinctions worldwide. Winifred Frick, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Linda. Mm. I am honored to be here today and talk to you about our mission to end bat extinctions worldwide. Bats are the only mammals capable of true flight, and this remarkable ability to fly is really a superpower and at the core of the many ways that bats are special. Being able to fly means that bats are found on every continent around the globe, with the exception of Antarctica, and are often the only land mammals in oceanic islands, including far-flung places like the Galapagos and the Hawaiian archipelago. Being able to fly has also allowed a tremendous diversification and bats represent the second most diverse group of mammals in the world, second only to the rodents. And um, they account for about 20% of mammalian biodiversity. We now know there are about 1400 different species of bats, but we're discovering new species every year. In fact, just this January, we announced the discovery of a new species that we found in a remote mountain range in West Africa. We were in the Nimba Mountains at the border of Guinea and Liberia, working on bat conservation for a critically endangered bat when we captured a bat we had never before seen or had been described. It was remarkable with this orange and black fur, and we knew immediately it had been something that nobody had previously described. So we're continuing to discover new species and being able to document the tremendous biodiversity of bats around the planet. Now with that incredible diversity of over 1400 different species around the world, bats do lots of different things and there's lots of different items on their menus, but over two thirds of bats retain the ancestral predilection of eating insects or other arthropod prey. And that turns out to be very good for us. Bats are voracious consumers of nocturnal insects, many of which are um, crop pests. So here in the United States, it's been estimated that bats actually provide $23 billion worth of value to the US agricultural industry. And that's not only cost savings to farmers, but it also reduces the amount of pesticides that farmers are putting on our food and on our lands. In Thailand, uh, it's been, um, my Thai bat colleagues have estimated the contribution that bats make to food security. The wrinkle-lipped bat, which is a common species in Thailand, um, eats the white-backed plant hopper, which is a known crop pest to rice plants. And their predation on this crop pest has been estimated in terms of the monetary value to Thai farmers and also the increase in yields, which is equivalent to producing enough rice to feed 26,000 people in Thailand each year. <clears throat> in addition to their role of eating insects and, and providing economic value to agricultural economies across the world, in tropical latitudes, many species of bats have evolved to eat fruit. And these frugivorous species um, tend to like fruits like figs. This is an artibia species from Panama, and it has a particular fondness for figs. And that has a special role because figs tend to be pioneer species. So when a bat grabs a fig fruit and flies across the forest and drops it, it may fly across an open area that's been cleared or is degraded. And figs tend to be, and so these pioneer species of figs can take root and start forest succession. And so they not only are important for maintaining tropical rainforests, but also for reforestation and regeneration in degraded forest habitats. 
Similarly, um, a number of species have, have, have evolved to um, specialize on nectar feeding and are important pollinators. Worldwide, bats pollinate about 500 different plant species, including species that have real economic value, um, like durian in Southeast Asia is primarily and depends on bat pollination. <clears throat> this species here is the lesser long-nosed bat, and one of the species that I study in the Sonoran deserts um, in northern Mexico and the southwestern United States. And these bats are remarkable. They do an um, annual migration where they come up from central or southern Mexico following a nectar corridor of night blooming cacti and agaves. And this cacti that this bat is visiting, these flowers are adapted for bat pollination. They open at night and they only last for um, one night and then they close again the following morning. And each plant may have different flowers opening at on different times. And so it's sort of a, a moving um, foraging resource. And the females migrate up from central Mexico into northern Mexico and the southwestern United States in the last stages of pregnancy, right before they give birth. And so when they arrive on, at their maternity caves um, and give birth all together in one synchronous pulse, um, they're really hungry and they're looking for these nectar um, resources on the landscape. And so um, some colleagues of mine, um, recently put miniaturized GPS trackers uh, on the same species at a cave in northern Mexico, just south of the US-Mexico border that you can see here on the maps. And these brightly colored squiggly lines are the individual tracks of a bat going from the maternity cave where a female has just given birth and has her pup in the cave, um, looking for patches of night blooming cacti that might change from night to night. So to put this in perspective, um, so these bats are only weigh about 25 grams. So that's like, you know, less, like smaller than your average hamster. And <clears throat> the distances on these um, nightly forays can be about 100 kilometers one way to the foraging patch or, or 60 miles. So that would be if we were all together in Philadelphia. And um, if you lived in Philadelphia and you left your newborn at home to travel to Atlantic City uh, every night to search for pop-up grocery stores so that you could get your meet your caloric needs every night and then have to drive back um, to Philly um, <clears throat> after you had fed. But of course, when bats find a flower and they visit it and tank up on the, the luscious nectar resource, they're also giving back to the plants because they're moving pollen across these distances and pollinating the plants every time they feed. So in addition to the real value that bats bring to their ecosystems that they live in, as well as to our agricultural ec um, economies, um, they're just fascinating. And there's so much to learn from this diverse and unusual group of mammals. This is one of my favorite species, which is a pallid bat, also occurs in the deserts of Mexico and the Southwestern US. And they love to eat scorpions and they're actually immune to scorpion venom. And they hunt for the scorpions. They listen to them scurrying on the desert floor before they pounce and um, take them for a nice tasty treat. But probably no species of, of bat <laughs> captures our fascination quite as much as the vampire bat. Now I want to emphasize again that there's over 1400 different species of bats in the world and only three are known to be sanguinivorous, meaning blood eating. And the common vampire bat, as its name implies, is the most common of those three. And I like to talk about vampire bats because <clears throat> they actually really listened in kindergarten and got the message that sharing is caring. And the way that vampire bats share, they're actually one of the few animals in nature that scientists have shown do true altruism, meaning that they will um, benefit roost mates um, or friends that they are not related to. And the way that vampire bats share is that if one goes out uh, and has a really nice night and gets a full belly full of blood and comes back to the roost and starts engaging with social chatter with its roost mate and learns that its roost mate uh, did not have a good night and is actually pretty hungry still, it'll uh, barf up its blood meal for its roost mate. So this always thrills the school kids when I talk about vampire bats know how to share and the way they share is barfing up their blood meal for their friend. Now, while we're talking about vampire bats, of course, you may be thinking, okay, yeah, well, what about rabies? And it's true that bats can carry and transmit rabies 
virus. However, with vaccinations and following proper guidelines of never handling wild animals, the risk of contracting rabies from wildlife in general is remarkably low. But while we're talking about disease, we need to talk about the fact that bats have been in the news a lot lately this year, right? Because of an association between bats and coronaviruses. Now, let me underscore that we do not know how the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID got into the human population. That is still under scientific investigation. What we do know, the reason why bats are, are broadly associated with the COVID pandemic is because um, these horseshoe bats, the rhinolophus bats in Asia, are known to tolerate a variety of different closely related um, SARS-like beta coronaviruses. And that ability to tolerate um, viruses is again linked to this idea that flight is a, it, a lens of superpower. And bats actually have really unusual immune systems um, that are um, basically underwhelmed by a lot of different viruses. So bats can tolerate viruses that might make other animals, if they got introduced into those other animals, um, quite sick. So there's a lot we can learn from bats in terms of how their mammalian immune systems work that might be useful for um, you know, our understanding our own immune systems in ways that we wish that it would work sometimes. But we've been trying to um, think about a lot, there's been a lot of, in addition to bats being in the media a lot um, uh, because of an association with their ability to tolerate viruses, there's also been quite a bit of scientific research this year that has come out investigating these linkages. And like we were just talking about in the Q&A with Dr. McCormick's speech, um, about the real need for breaking down academic silos and thinking about um, the importance of interdisciplinary research. That is so true in this um, field of trying to understand the, um, um, the, the, the inner relationships of different factors that lead to the conditions for zoonotic spillover. So this graph from my colleagues, Dr. Um, Dan Stryker and Dr. Amy Gilbert, um, really points to the complexity and the type of um, expertise that we have to master to really understand how um, viruses um, can move between different um, animal hosts and create the conditions for zoonotic spillover. So they talk about the evolutionary drivers of thinking about things like lifespan and flight, intrinsic factors, so that has to do with immune systems, also um, more ecological or population biology factors like social structure and um, colony size, as well as individual heter heterogeneity, but importantly also thinking about the human animal interface and the ways in which we are um, breaking down the natural ecological integrity that leads to the opportunities for viruses to move among species. And let me draw your attention then to the top here that underlies all of this context is the ways in which we are disturbing <clears throat> and disrupting nature and the planet. So when we think about <clears throat> that land use and climate change and urbanization and the wildlife trade and also persecution like intentional killing um, of animals, that those are um, uh, core mechanisms that lead to the conditions for increased risk of spillover. If we compare that then to the, um, our review of the main threats to bats around the world, unfortunately what we see is that those same mechanisms are the top level threats um, to our global bat diversity. So the take home message here is that instead of scapegoating bats and worrying about um, the, the a linkage between bats and, and coronaviruses, we're really to blame and uh, we're causing the core conditions of disrupting ecological integrity and, um, and, and, and destroying um, nature. And those are the conditions that lead to, to, to spillover risk that can turn into pandemics. And really, it's our ability to move novel pathogens around that poses much more risk to bats than bats pose to us. Just this week, we published a paper on the scope and severity of white nose syndrome, which is a disease of hibernating bats here in North America. This is a disease that's caused by a fungal pathogen that was introduced at first, this disease first emerged in upstate New York in 2007. 
Um, and, and it was through some kind of human trait or travel that moved this pathogen from where it naturally occurs in temperate Europe and Asia um, into North America. And it has caused widespread mass mortality of multiple species as it has spread. And this recent paper, which compiles data from the most comprehensive analysis of the impacts to date, we've determined that we've lost 90% of the known populations of three species that were common and widespread before this fungus was introduced. And to visually show you what that looks like, this is an animation of the little brown bat. The red circles represent the number of the size of the colonies of winter uh, winter colonies, a number of bats, and as you see the disease in gray start to spread, you see those red circles shrink and shrink. Those are the dying numbers of bats until this is all that we have left as of this year. If we zoom back out globally, um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is a global um, network of scientists who rank the level of imperilment of different species, um, considers 21 bat species to be critically endangered, another 83 to be endangered, 109 are classified as vulnerable, all three together, that's over 200 species that are threatened with extinction. And then another 234 species that are considered data deficient, which means that we don't have enough data to um, be able to classify them according to these, um, these buckets. Uh, oftentimes data deficient species are either newly discovered species or species that are so rare that we don't know how to classify them and um, may also be uh, vulnerable um, to extinction. But perhaps even more worryingly, um, of the species that IUCN classifies as not being threatened, we actually don't know much about what's happening with their populations. Over 50% of the bat species that are considered non-threatened have an unknown population trend, and an additional 25% have a decreasing population trend. And that's actually significantly more uh, for what uh, that we know, we know significantly more less. <laughs> the, uh, we know less about the population trends of bats than we know about for other animals or birds. But altogether, what this means is that three quarters of the species that from a conservation standpoint, we would like to sort of say, okay, they're doing okay. They're either in decline or we actually don't know how they're doing. So if you tally all that up, um, we have 213 species considered threatened, 234 species considered data deficient, 125 species that are considered not threatened but have declining population trends. So that's a signal that there's something wrong and 456 species that we don't know what's um, their population trend. That's over a thousand bat species that need some kind of conservation or research attention. To put that number in perspective, when I started bat biology <laughs> 20 years ago, there were only 900 described species. So more species need our conservation and research attention than we even knew existed 900, um, uh, 20 years ago. So it's easy to feel really overwhelmed by that. I think, you know, like big problems like climate change can, you know, leave us feeling somewhat paralyzed about the magnitude and scope of this problem. Um, but that's precisely my job. My job is to figure out how are we gonna go about saving these species from extinction and getting action on the ground um, now. And so, you know, we just have to roll up our sleeves and figure out what we can do, how we can do it, and where we can do it. So we built a prioritization rubric. And the first axis is vulnerability. Although, as I've just shown you, identifying the species and habitats in need isn't a particularly useful prioritization <laughs> tool because there's more than, than, well, than I can get to in my lifetime. So we have to look at also feasibility. Where are the places where it's feasible to work, where we've built the partnerships that, it, um, that we can take action? And also our impact. What are the threats that we can address? And where can we get to conservation outcomes that really lead to protecting species and their habitats? And so this prioritization um, rubric really underscores the strategic plan that we've just embarked on at Bat Conservation International. And we're looking at um, implementing endangered species interventions, 
protecting and restoring landscapes, doing research to develop scalable solutions, to deliver conservation to the species in need and inspiring through experience. And I don't have time to walk you through all of the work that we're doing. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the um, projects and approaches that we're taking. And so when we think about our endangered species interventions, this is a program in which we're focusing on what are, um, what are the species that need to that could go extinct in the next five years that we need to get boots on the ground to protect them. Now, um, we think of caves as being iconic habitats for bats and about 40% of bat species um, live in caves. And caves provide both a real vulnerability, but also an opportunity for bat conservation. Vulnerability in the sense that you have one target focal habitat that um, may contain the entire population um, of, a, uh, of, a, of a species. And so if we lose that site, we could see a global extinction event. Uh, but they're also an opportunity because Again, they're a, they're a focal spatial habitat. And so we can put our um, energy and focus on protecting that site and keep a species from going extinct. Um, what I like to think of as our action to impact ratio. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We've identified cave roofs around the world that contain the last remaining population of species. And I'm gonna talk about our project in Jamaica because Jamaica is a fascinating place that has these incredible cave ecosystems um, that are actually found throughout the Caribbean called hot caves. These are caves formed from karst or limestone and they are complex, um, uh, subterranean habitats that can have as many as 13 different species in them and the presence of large numbers of bats ranging from common species to really rare species creates this incredibly hot environment. That's why they're called hot caves. It can be 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit inside those sites. Um, and the bats actually adapted to that really high heat. And so if we see severe population declines um, and we lose the present, the bats actually sort of make that habitat. They, they participate in the making of the, of the um, extreme environment that they, that they need. And so if we see the populations decline, then they'll be very hard to restore. So we're focusing on a critically endangered bat called the Jamaican flower bat that's endemic to Jamaica. It's only found there. It was previously thought to be extinct, but then was rediscovered a number of years ago. And it is now only known in one site left. Um, and we're working with the Jamaican government to actually purchase the land around that site and protect it um, from disturbance and, and, and other types of things that might destroy the habitat. So. Um, and, and, and our efforts there will be um, to basically prevent the extinction of this particular species. And then um, I want to go back to reminding you about our, um, our incredible nectar feeding bats um, that, in central, in, in, that migrate from Mexico up into um, the southwestern US, our little pop-up foragers. Um, a closely related species does a similar migration from central Mexico but they actually migrate up the northeastern side of Mexico into the Chihuahuan deserts and rely almost entirely on agave plants. And, um, and so, as I was saying earlier, they, um, they migrate up when they're pregnant and then they get up to these habitats and they need to be able to refuel and, and, and get this delicious nectar um, while they're um, giving birth and raising their pups. But due to climate change and land use change, um, we're seeing fewer and fewer agaves on the landscape. And so what we've realized is that in addition to protecting the roosts for this species, we also need to provide them with um, resilient landscapes full of nectar. And so we're working on restoring agaves across the migratory corridor of these species um, and working with um, local Mexican communities um, to, because the agaves also provide tremendous value um, to local communities and to soil st stability. And so we're planting agaves and restoring the agaves, recognizing that while bats provide food security to us in, in, in many parts of the world, we also need to provide food security to the bats. And so with that, I hope what um, I've been able to share with you today is just how important this mission to end bat extinctions, to protect biodiversity for bats is, not just for bats, but for all of us. 
and I would love to to open it up to discussion and take your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I told you before the session started, um, just by coincidence, I happen to be a real bat fan. And um, I was suggesting to you that maybe some bat tourism would help the situation. Um, the city of Austin, Texas has a, a large population of migratory bats that spend all uh, winter, uh, summer there, summer come up from Mexico and people take boat trips down the river in Austin to what at, at dusk to watch the bats um, fly out from under the under the bridges. So um, there may be some help to local economies if people are if cities are lucky enough to, to have bats. One of the real gee whizzes of nature I ever saw was in the city of San Salvador in El, El Salvador in front of the hotel was a cherry tree and very large fruit eating bats were swooping down and picking the cherries and swooping down one direction and another. And a crowd of people were standing there watching this. It was uh, like watching a nature film right in, in front of our eyes. But oh yeah, it's fabulous. I, I have one question and, and I, I think there are others. Uh, when you talk about the 1400 species and finding new species, are these newly found species or are they newly evolved species? Is there speciation going on, uh, evolution going on currently? Well, there's always evolution going on currently. Um, and they're probably, uh, yeah, there were probably, there probably are speciation events that are, are hard to document. Mostly when we're adding um, new species to our total, it's because we're understanding co like species complex, a lot of bats are um, hard to tell apart in the hand. So um, just like we were hearing earlier about, you know, our ability to use new tools at molecular tools to be able to understand new things about the past. Obviously that's, you know, very true in the biological sciences. Um, and so we have better ways of describing species using molecular tools. Um, and so there's, there's whole complexes of species that we're now understanding you know, that maybe we're all lumped together um, as one species that we're not understanding are actually um, uh, you know, lots of different species. Um, that's true in Africa. There's been um, a lot of different species that we've learned are, um, and there's still a lot more work to do of, of figuring out, okay, well, this complex that was called one species is actually multiple species. Um, in the in the case of Myotis nimbaensis, that was really um, more of we were in a in a place and captured something nobody had ever captured before. So that that was um, um, you know something that wasn't like oh we just we realized that like this was split off from another species. It was really that Western scientists had never um, never captured that that bat before. So that was right. very exciting. But that is much much rarer. Yeah. A question from our member Rowena Matthews. What is the distribution of white nose disease in the US? So it's in, um, the disease is now found in over 30 states and US uh, um, and Canadian and seven Canadian provinces. Um, and so it is found coast to coast. Um, the disease is found, um, it started in upstate New York and has spread um, in a wavefront um, through the mid-Atlantic and into southeastern US and into um, the Midwest. It's found in as far west as Texas um, and Nebraska. Um, and then there, a number of years ago, there was a, a, a separate, a disjunct emergence in Washington state. Um, and, um, and so it's really just sort of the Western states that um, remain disease free at this point. Uh, Susan Solomon has a question. She says, wonderful talk, thanks very much. I may have missed it. Are there any known species of bats known to be increasing? And do you think the widespread bat extinctions could be related to the decrease in insect biomass documented around the world? Yeah, those are great questions. So on the IUCN, I think there was only one or two species that were listed as increasing populations in terms of their classification system. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't species out there that um, are, are, you know, there's a number that are, are stable or, or doing well. Um, we are really worried about the insect apocalypse and what kind of effect that has on our insectivorous bats here in North America. 
Um, all of our bats, except for those migratory nectar feeding bats that get into the southwestern US during part of their migration um, season, um, are insectivorous. And so that insect prey base is really important. That's actually something I didn't have time to talk about, but that we're actually currently working on is trying to um, work with folks who are trying to increase um, insect prey in areas as a strategy, again, trying to provide food security for the bats um, and, and targeting in areas where um, bats are impacted by white nose to try to help increase foraging um, efficiency in part because what we know about white nose is that it has a really high metabolic cost. And the way that disease kills the bats is that it causes them to um, wake up from hibernation too frequently and they burn up their fat reserves. But it, but if we can, bats can put on more fat mass in the fall. And so if we can help bats get fat in the fall, we can hopefully help them survive. So it's what we call our fat bat project. Mm -hmm. okay. It's after five o'clock. Um, I think we have to wrap up and remind people that uh, at seven o'clock tonight, we have a special concert from Benjamin Franklin Hall. Uh, by Emmanuel Axe. So stick around or come back. And uh, Winifred, thank you very much for this enlightening talk. Thank the, all of our speakers today. And uh, we'll be back tonight and we'll be back tomorrow.